Welcome to my channel. I am Dr. Hampton. And if you're new to my channel, I'm a board certified family and obesity medicine doctor with additional training in nutrition and functional medicine. And I want to do a shout out to my uh, university, University of Western States, for providing uh, a wonderful education uh, that's helping me understand the root cause of disease. Today, I want to share a special video with you to talk about uh, starting low carb. And I want to make sure when we start low carb, we're going to do it safe and keep it simple. So I'll do that by sharing my screen, which I'll do right now. And as I share my screen, I'll pull up some slides so we can kind of walk through this idea of how to uh, start low carb safely with a kiss. Now, when you think about it, when I met my lovely wife, we eventually decided that we wanted to commit to each other. And uh, so we made a commitment. And I think many of you are making commitments to uh, lifestyle changes. Rather, it's what you eat. Um, rather, it's how much sleep you get, how much stress you uh, stay away from. Or these are things that we're all trying to do. So uh, the same is true uh, for me and my wife. We committed to each other and we decided, you know what? Let's commit to each other. So when you make that commitment uh, to low carb, you want to keep it uh, safe and simple by starting with a kiss, just like we did when we started our 29-year marriage uh, as of uh, a few weeks before this recording. So we're really excited about that. And I'm also excited that you're on a journey to heal from metabolic disease. So let's start with the safe part. It's so important that we remove the myths, right? Because you hear people say, well, you know, low carb is not safe. Uh, it's not good for you. It's going to cause this and that. And the key is to understand what's happening to your body. And once you understand what's happening, that removes the fear because the benefits are so tremendous that they outweigh any concerns. And, and once you know what to do about it, you're okay. So let's talk about safety first. So let's start with what, you know, who should consider this diet in the first place. <clears throat> I would argue anybody who suffers from metabolic disease, right? Now, you're like, well, what the heck is metabolic disease, metabolic health doc? Well, it's anybody who does not have normal blood sugars, normal blood pressure, uh, a waist circumference that's too uh, wide, and, and or a triglyceride level that's too high. That's one of the fat, that's the fats in your blood. And of course, if you have the good cholesterol, HDL, that's too low. So they say three out of five have to be abnormal to have metabolic syndrome. But ultimately, if you have any that's abnormal, in my opinion, that's enough to justify considering a low-carb diet, which in my mind, and based on randomized controlled trials, is the best diet to achieve metabolic health. So, And, and, and so patients who are uh, checking their blood sugars and they're noticing that they're struggling with that, uh, those are also people who should do well. And you really want to be prepared when you're making these changes because your blood sugars will start to normalize. And sometimes it normalizes so fast, you could be at risk for a low blood sugar. So what is a low-carb diet? There's a lot of definitions that you'll see on social media. And it's not that any are wrong. It's just that they're different. And so the uh, therapeutic uh, guidelines for carb restriction were put together by the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners and Low Carb USA. And they are, um, this is the source that I use to give you this. So again, it's not the gold standard necessarily, but it's what we use as a general guide. Very low carb uh, diets are less than 30 grams. Um, and low carb diets are in the 30 to 50 range. Uh, most of my patients start at 50 uh, total carbs that they try to stay under. And some people choose to go to the 20 to 30 range. If you're really seeking uh, success, you want to keep it probably less than 30 or 20. And then, of course, less than 130 carbs is what we consider a reduced carb diet, which sounds high until you realize that for many people on the standard American diet, uh, they're eating like 250 or higher. So it's much reduced for people who are on that dietary pattern. So let's start with the kidneys. A lot of people hear, well, if I'm on low carb, um, the protein's going to cause problems. And the reality is, 
if you are uh, if you have mild to moderate kidney uh, uh, you know problems insufficiency, it's really little evidence to suggest that that's really a problem. Now, if you have a more advanced kidney disease, more severe, you do want to be careful because there is sometimes a disconnect between a kidney diet and a low carb diet, and you want to work with a clinician like myself who is familiar with metabolic disease. Now, if you um, have, uh, you know, some issues with that, that's, again, that's something that you and your doctor have to discuss. But as a general rule, mild to moderate uh, kidney uh, uh, issues is not really a big issue. So just keep that in mind. You shouldn't worry too much about that. Some people come to me with a history of gout or kidney stones. And in that case, uh, you do want to be mindful because there is a little competition between ketones going going through your urine and uric acid, which we think about for gout. And of course, some kidney stones are made from uric acid. So if people are at risk for that, they've had it in the past, we will ease them into a low-carb diet. And we also consider allopurinol, so we make less uric acid. Those are two things that you can do one or the other, or you can do uh, both. But either way, if you ease into it, you'll probably do fine. The other thing to keep in mind is that if you're going in and out of ketosis, in and out of a low carb diet, then that may put you at risk also for a flare. So it's best for people who are at high risk to try to be more consistent than a person who doesn't have that risk. When it comes to your blood pressure, you may ask, well, why am I even mentioning blood pressure? Isn't the diet here to treat the blood pressure? And the answer is, of course it does. And, and it's so effective that we sometimes worry that it works too fast. So so what you want to do if you have a history of hypertension is just to be aware that you're going to probably be uh, getting rid of salt because I always tell my patients carbohydrates uh, attract water and salt. So if you stop eating those uh, foods uh, at a high level, you may be getting rid of salt and water, which can drop your blood pressure, make you feel fatigue, headache, lightheadedness. So, so it's very important that people who um, have issues with uh, their blood pressure to really monitor their blood pressures pretty closely. And, uh, and, and it's really important also people on a low carb diet that they're not really restricting salt unless they are uh, at high risk, they're very salt sensitive, or they have congestive heart failure. So, so that's kind of one of the cool things about a low carb diet is that you can eat fat, you can eat salt. So the food tends to take taste pretty good. Now, Westman and Stillman in their paper said that you know they have their patients sipping on uh, broths, uh, uh, you know, on a regular basis, and sodium bouillon cubes and things like that to add the salt back. So. So again, just keep that in mind, and you want to be you want to be monitoring your blood pressure on a regular basis at home. And sometimes we bring people into the clinic more often when they're making these lifestyle changes, so we can maybe have the nurse check their blood pressure just to make sure we can reduce the medicines because the low carb diet is a very effective way to get off of blood pressure medicines. Just this past week, I think I had uh, a couple of days during the week where several patients were reducing medicines or getting off of blood pressure medicines by simply doing uh, a low-carb diet. And of course, when we think about low-carb, we think about uh, diabetes. And it's really important that when you're uh, considering a low-carb diet, that you're really preparing yourself to reduce the amount of medicines you're taking. Uh, and again, you want to work with a doctor who has an understanding of what's happening to your body so that they can help you reduce your medicines. Otherwise, you may end up with low blood sugars and needing to treat that. And that's not what we don't want. Now, there are certain medicines like Actos and Avandia that you know may need to be stopped uh, because they can contribute to weight gain. So it's just something um, uh, to consider. And then you have uh, DPP-4 inhibitors, uh, drugs like uh, Genuvia, GLP-1, uh, analogs, things like Trulicity, uh, those are usually pretty safe. The SGLT2 inhibitors, you need to use those with caution because they can dehydrate you and in some cases can be associated with diabetic ketoacidosis. Again, nutritional ketosis is okay. Diabetic ketoacidosis is not okay. And then metformin, which is commonly used uh, on a low-carb diet is considered uh, 
pretty safe. So just keep those things in mind. Other things you want to think about is warfarin. Uh, sometimes you have to, you know, as you know, if you're on warfarin, you have to, you know, kind of monitor your dosages. So anything that's being monitored, like warfarin, uh, you know, Depakote, lithium, those types of drugs, you want to really uh, pay attention to those drugs and make sure that you're monitoring them closely just to make sure they're not uh, changing. And then other drugs that you want to consider that can also cause weight gain, uh, beta blockers, antidepressants, antipsychotics. Again, we're really trying to do a lot of things metabolically. One is to lose weight. So you don't want to take medicines that inhibit you from breaking down fat. It doesn't really make sense. So, so keep that in mind. And it's really important, again, that you're checking your blood sugar and your blood pressure regularly. And that's how you keep your journey uh, to achieve low carb safe. So, so how do I know some of this stuff? Well, you know, I got a board certification in obesity medicine. I'm getting a master's in nutrition. But I also have my society, not my society, but the Society of Metabolic Health Practitioners. And the society has resources. So if you're working with a doctor who's not as familiar with metabolic health, that may be a great resource for them. And here's their website here, the links. And as you see towards the bottom here, the clinical guidelines can be found. Those guidelines were made uh, in conjunction with other uh, uh, experts, but primarily Adele Height, who helped put that together. And uh, that's really a great resource. So I would actually go to that site get those clinical guidelines in front of you, maybe present that to your clinician if they're not familiar and say, hey, I'm trying to do this diet and I just need help to do it safely. Would you consider working with me and checking out these guidelines? So let's talk a little bit about the keep it simple portion of the discussion. Again, um, <clears throat> I'm only showing you the slide again to say, uh, here are the criteria, but if you keep it simple, you just say, I'm just gonna do less than maybe 20 or 30 grams of carbs per day. And, and to really keep it simple, I'm not gonna do net carbs where you subtract the fiber and the sugar alcohols. I'm just gonna do you know, total carbs. So that'll eliminate some of those processed uh, foods that you can buy, those keto-friendly foods. But at the end of the day, if you keep it simple and just reduce your carbs to about 20 or 30 grams a day, you'll be just fine. Um, this idea of trying to do a ketogenic diet, for example, and where you measure the macros, <clears throat> the fat, the protein, and the carbs, most of my patients don't do that. I think that's a little overdone. Now, certain types of patients will want to do that, and that's fine. But if you keep it simple, you don't have to measure anything, but you do focus on the carbs. That's the only thing you really focus on, as opposed to trying to get your ratios at a certain level, and it's really not necessary to do what you see on that screen. And what I love about this um, diet is that it really does uh, treat a lot of conditions. Now, the ones in front of you, if you have a patient who it just happens to be metabolically unhealthy and they're overweight and they have dementia and it's early, you could probably safely do that. You wouldn't want to do that in a person with dementia who's struggling to eat. But things like epilepsy are a no-brainer. You may have to have tight control. And in that setting, you may want to measure ketones and things like that. But for most conditions like um, blood pressure, diabetes, and things like that, you really don't have to do all of that extra measuring. You just have to get your carbs down to a certain level. That's why most of my patients do not use uh, blood tests, urine tests, or breath tests to measure their ketones because they don't really have to. Again, if you're the kind of person that just needs that data, I think that's fine. But for most people, you don't have to do that. So I wouldn't really focus on that. Some people think it's necessary to intermittently fast because so many people in the low-carb community fast. I would argue that that's also not necessary, but most people will find themselves fasting because they're not hungry. Because once you're in ketosis and you're burning your belly fat for fuel, you're not going to be that hungry. So so a lot of people just won't eat, but it's not required. So again, keep it simple. And if you find that you're not hungry down the road, it's okay to do that. But you don't have to start with things like intermittent fasting. And you definitely don't need to go and buy all these keto products. You'll see keto this, low carb that. And the reality is that's okay, but it's not necessary. And some of these products you really can't 
use if you're doing that total carb approach because most of them, uh, except for a few exceptions, are actually based on a uh, net carb methodology, meaning that uh, it'll, you know, for example, a slice of bread, maybe 14 carbs uh, minus the uh, fiber, which may be 13 or 14, or the sugar alcohol. So ultimately, you do have a net carb of one or zero, but at the end of the day, that's not the most effective uh, way to do this low-carb diet. So here's an example of a good uh, low-carb product that's conveniently uh, made for you. So you take cauliflower and you rice it out. So this is like, if you look at the ingredients, it's just cauliflower. That's okay. So that's a package product that I endorse. Another example is like, you know, taking cheese and turn into these little crisps. That's okay because the ingredients are basically just cheese. So, so these types of products are okay. What's, what's less favorable are the highly processed things that they are uh, creating for your consumption when you should just be keeping it simple. And this is what your plate should look like. Um, what's your animal that you prefer? Uh, we're not putting barbecue sauce, cornmeal, or flour on it. And what's your non-starchy vegetable? It's really that simple. And you can really just eat one vegetable. You can have two, but they need to be non-starchy. That's really what low carb is all about. Choose your animal, choose your one or two non-starchy sides, and that's it. So if you keep it simple and do that, you'll do just fine. So I just wanted to just take a moment to give you a feel for how I look at this. And I really, um, really just appreciate the fact that if we keep things simple, uh, low carb is not very complicated. And so I really am excited that so many people are starting to take this journey. And I just wanted to give you a little bit of a kiss today. I dressed up for you just to make sure you knew I was really serious about giving you a kiss. And I'm just excited that you're on this journey. So I want you to continue to consume this information, gradually learn, get better at it, and over time, incrementally, you'll achieve your health-related goals. So thank you again for coming to my channel. And until we have another video, continue to be safe, be well, and continue to protect your 